Fala, galera do Nós Nerds. Estamos aqui com mais uma entrevista internacional com Steven Spawn, da Able Gamers. Eles são uma instituição de caridade americana que tem um trabalho maravilhoso. Eles desenvolvem controles e formas para que pessoas com algum tipo de dificuldade ou deficiência física consigam jogar. Então, vai desde pessoas que tenham um problema numa mão, que tenham só uma mão, até pessoas com, com tetraplegia, que consigam mexer quase nada ou nada do corpo, assim. É, as entrevistas que a gente faz aqui normalmente são uma coisa mais, mais suave, mais contraída. Essa entrevista foi muito emocionante para mim, assim, as histórias deles são, são maravilhosas. E, e me inspirou a gente a fazer um evento de caridade para ajudar essa instituição, que apesar de americana, eles enviam um controle sem custo para o mundo inteiro, inclusive já forneceram para o Brasil. Então fica aí até o final do vídeo, no final do vídeo eu vou divulgar dados aí sobre esse evento. É, mais uma vez em inglês, a tradução do, do Google tá ok. Só o comecinho do vídeo deu um pau na conexão do Skype, então tá, tá meio picotadinho o vídeo. Mas passando esse comecinho que é só bate-papo aí, as histórias, o resto do áudio tá bem legal. Então aproveita aí, curta, um abraço a todos. Falou! Hi everyone from the We are here for another international interview. This time we are here with Steven Spawn from Able Gamers, a charity that does a, uh, an amazing job, and we're going to talk about this. Hi Steve, how are you? I'm doing well. How about you? I'm great. Thank you very much. Let's start with uh, what you do, which is for Able Gamers. Can you tell a little bit for your and what you guys do? Yeah, so Able Gamers is a nonprofit organization in America that helps people with disabilities be able to play games. We source money from the gaming community, which has been amazing and generous, and then take that money, turn around, and find the specific controllers that are made for people with disabilities. So if you have only, say, the use of one arm, we might give you a controller that works with just one hand, or if you have a quadriplegic issue or if you have something where you can't use you know anything from the neck down like you're a c6 c7 quadriplegic then we have eye controllers eyebrow controllers you know we can basically use any abilities you have and allow you to play video games wow you just answered half the questions i had to do <laughs> well thanks for your time <laughs> 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 no well uh I think that the job you guys do is amazing. Uh, I have one of the reasons I reach out for you guys is, is, is I have, that I have, a, I have a cousin that has uh, a disability. Uh, he was born with his with born left hand. Uh, his left hand fingers, let's say, are, are shorter. And this worked pretty well while we were on Nintendo and Atari and the other channel. And now with me, uh, it became very hard on our time. And he actually had an able game in our time in Brazil. So he actually had to do all this work. He had to fight by himself. He actually borrowed me his, his Xbox controller just so he can get a look. And oh, he, nice. just, what he did, he has difficulties reaching the, the left trigger and the left button. So what he did is he repositioned the left trigger from here to here. And he did, and then he did some modding. I think the B button is here, which helps him out playing Gears of War. And yep. But this is this is basically what you guys do, right? You, you take a specific disability, take a disability, and you try to work out to solve the problem. Yeah, we. So what we do is we work sort of backwards from the most common off-the-shelf stuff to making custom controllers like that controller there. So. For your cousin, I would show him a controller that's called the Envenger. The Envenger is a, think of a cover that slips over your Xbox. Okay. Um, I'm also disabled. I don't, I am nearly quadriplegic, so that's why I'm not grabbing one and showing you right oh. now. But, um, but if you want to cut it into post, uh, the, the Envenger is a cool little gadget that slips over top of your Xbox controller mm -hmm. and it allows you to slip your fingers through little loops that then pull the trigger. Instead of having to reach under the controller, you can leave it like flat on your desk and put your fingers through these little loops and it pulls trigger buttons for you. Oh. It was, yeah, it was actually developed by a teacher that had a student that had a skin condition. And every time their fingers would rub under the controller, it would peel off the layers of their skin and right, like right down to the muscle. 
So they needed to find a way that they could hold the controller without actually holding it. Mm-hmm. So they came up with these little loop-like devices that would push the button for you. It's really, it's really pretty ingenuitive, and uh, it works out for a lot of people who can't hold the controller in a quote-unquote standard way. Okay. So you guys also have, let's say, like standard solutions, or, or do you do a custom controller for every single case? Yeah, so like I was saying, we sort of work backwards, and we'll we'll show the person what the standard off-the-shelf solutions are. Okay. That way, if so, if they want to buy it themselves, the consultation from us is free. Like, let's say you had a an issue where you couldn't play with a standard controller, you would come to us and say, "Hey, Steve, here's the issues that I have with playing the, on the an Xbox or PlayStation, whatever your PC," mm-hmm. and then. I would say, okay, well, here's your off-the-shelf ideas. You could buy this, you could buy this, you could put this and this together, and that might work for you. We would try out a couple of things, see if they work, and if they don't work, then we would go and make something custom. And then the payment just it depends on your station in life. So some people want their controllers really quickly, and they're willing to pay right off the shelf, and they you know, reach out to the manufacturers themselves. We just make the connection, and then we're just, you know, wash our hands of it and say, all right, here you go, good luck. If they want to come through us, there's about a 10-week waiting period because we're pretty in demand these days where we'll actually buy the controller for the person, but we work on a first-come, first-served basis. So if so, it takes a while to get through our system. Um, you know, we help anywhere from a 1,000 or more people per year, and that includes consulting with them, letting them try controllers, and then getting them controllers. and. Wow. Um, we actually have helped people in Brazil. Um, really? So we've yeah. helped yeah, Brazil, Australia, Europe, Germany. Um, yeah, we've, we've, we've gotten around a little bit. Cool. This is amazing. So you guys serve worldwide. Yeah, it's just more complicated because you have to do all of those ones via Skype, whereas we would much rather bring someone into our headquarters. Mm-hmm. We have um, we have a really cool laboratory outside of Washington, D.C., it's it's like three warehouses big. It's pretty pretty amazing. Wow. It's got like computers and Xboxes and Playstations all set up with a three D printer. And we can actually bring people in and then sit them down at each controller and say, How about this one? What do you think about this one? What do you think about this one? And then we're able to like really go through all the possibilities really quickly. It's sort of like watching like have you ever seen NASCAR, like just like a bunch of people gathered around somebody just like, How about this? Check this one out. <laughs> okay. But, I mean, you guys are huge. How, how many people work for you or, or at Able Gamers or with you guys? We have two full-time employees and then another dozen or so volunteers. Um, myself and the founder, neither one of us uh, are currently employed at this time. We're trying to funnel all the money back into the charity. Okay. So the founder and I, um, we do this on a volunteer basis, 40, 60 hours a week, wow. and then two Two full-time people, our head of research, and our program director. And then we have a whole bunch of very cool, very amazing volunteers that give their time and, and help us out at conventions and, and uh, allow us to really do what we do to reach out to the community. Cool. And, and the volunteers are in, in the Washington, D.C. area with you guys? Oh, no, not at all. Okay. I'm in Pittsburgh. Uh, our program director is in Ohio. Um, our main head, of course, is in Washington, D.C., we're all over America, two people in the UK. Our vice president is actually from outside of Manchester. So wow. we're yeah, we're we're all over the place. Our our main operation base is in America, mm-hmm. but if you know, if you need help and you reach out to us, we're not gonna refuse to help you based on where you are in the world. Okay. Nice. Uh, another question, uh, we, we are coming out from, let's say, many years of, of uh, war conflicts. There was like Iraq, yeah. uh, Afghanistan and all that, and we know that, yeah. that people get hurt a lot and they lose yeah. power limbs and stuff. Do you guys have a lot of veterans coming in, and, and or, or is it more like people that were born with disabilities? Do, do, is there... It's it's both. We um, So our founder was actually in, in service-related injured Air Force veteran. So he, of course, cares very deeply, as do all of us, about you know American vets and vets all around the world from all the countries. Um, if, if you have had a traumatic war injury, then you know 
we do what we can as well. We have some fabulous one-handed controllers. We've got some devices that will allow you to play even if you only have stumps or nubs on your arms. If you've had a few fingers that have been removed, uh, we all have different devices that will work for that as well. The With our current base, the primary people that come to us are people between the age of about let's say 16 and 28, um, sort of the younger demographic. Uh, they're usually in the profoundly disabled category, something like a multiple sclerosis or a Duchenne muscular dystrophy, okay. um, something where you might need like a, a sip and puff device where you control an Xbox controller with your mouth instead of like your hands. Um, but you know, that said, we've helped a lot of people from a lot of different walks of life. Um, our, the coolest one was we had a stream just uh, two days ago, I don't know if you got to catch it, but it was uh, blind gamers playing um, Persona 5, just uh, wow. without any visuals whatsoever. So it's really cool. Wow. Yeah. How did that work? This... Well, if you're a blind gamer, you go completely off of shapes, colors, and sounds. So you can't necessarily see the screen, but if you're hard of you know, vision, then you will get used to shapes and colors. Like, you'll know, you know, oh, okay, well, that enemy is slightly red tinged, or it's a bigger blob, okay. or something like that. If you're someone who's completely blind, you might be playing, say, a Zelda game or um, uh, Castlevania. You know, all of those older games, they were all generated in the, in the same way every time. So blind gamers will actually learn if this sound goes off, that means I've hit this monster, and then this one's going to be over here. So I have to wait three seconds and then push X, and then you know, wow, they can they can beat the entire game without seeing the screen at all. Wow, I mean, I, I never thought about that that something like this could yep. be possible. That's very very cool. There's there's a lot of really cool gamers out there, and you know, our Twitch channel, Twitch TV slash Able Gamers, we do our best to use our media attention to put the spotlight on individual gamers that you know are out there playing the games their way and you know, mm -hmm. our our motto is simply that if you want to play a game there's a way to do it it might not be the way that the world tells you you need to do it but you can find a way oh this is amazing and i think this connects directly we, we put up the the interview in our facebook page and some people sent questions and one yeah. of them was actually uh the, was about uh, the satisfaction you get from 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 the work. I mean, I, I, uh, I'm assuming that is it's, it's, <laughs> it's a daily it's, basis for you guys, right? It's it, it's actually it's it's pretty amazing. So to answer that question, I'll I'll tell you a, a short story. So we were at a convention in a small town outside of Chicago, Illinois, and. Mm -hmm. It was a disability convention, so there were lots of people with varying disabilities there looking at all kinds of devices, and we like going to these as sort of our community outreach. It's, it's where we reach out to people who don't know that video games can be played mm -hmm. if you're disabled, because a lot of the disability community still doesn't realize that it's possible. Mm -hmm. So part of, our, yeah, part of our outreach is to bring an Xbox and PlayStation, and sometimes we're even sponsored by Microsoft, and we'll actually go and bring stations, TVs, platforms to these places, right? So we, we have our normal four TV set up, set up in a circular fashion with all different kinds of controllers and whatnot, and this family comes up. It's a mom and a dad and a sister and a brother and another young brother in a wheelchair He's profoundly disabled. He is reclined. There's a heart monitor on his table. He's drooling. He seems to have full cognitive function. When I said hello, he smiled and, you know, maybe seven, seven and a half years old. Wow. Really amazing little dude. Uh, really cool. Uh, but he had no motor function, so he couldn't move his arms, his legs. And his family is just kind of standing there. And they're looking in our games. We have Forza 2 on the screen. And... We're, you know, showing off the racing game with someone else who has <clears throat> some problems holding a controller. And uh, I'm like, hey, why don't you come over and try this out? And they're like, no, 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 we can't do that, you know, he doesn't have the ability. And I'm like, no, seriously, come over. So eventually I talked to parents into bringing him over. And he sits in front of the racing game. And we check out his movements, his abilities, and we notice that he's got a little tiny movement in his foot. Okay. So my founder and I, Mark, are st standing next to each other, and we're like, all right, well, 
let's try this. So he runs off. He grabs a foot pedal, just like basically in your car. Mm -hmm. Plugs it into a device that we have called an Adroit. The Adroit lets you plug switches into a box that acts like an Xbox controller. Okay. So we put it, put in the switch, put in the foot pedal to the Xbox controller. Put it near his foot. He pushes the gas pedal, and the car takes off roaring, smashes into a wall. He is giggling and just squealing, and his parents are just like, oh, my God, it's amazing. And, you know, of course, the brother and sister are cheering him on because he just crashed into a wall. So the whole family is just, you know, loving it. And, you know, we told him exactly how to, how to, to get the switch pedal and get that, and we gave him the controller on the spot, and we thought, you know, great, we helped somebody to, to have, you know, a, a good time gaming. And the next day... It was the end of the conference. The dad, who is six foot something tall, maybe 12 feet tall. I don't know. He's tall. And okay. it's like looking at me, looking up at the rock, like it's a huge dude. <laughs> and uh, and he, he taps me on the shoulder and uh, I turn around and he's got tears in his eyes. And I'm like, hey, you know, everything OK? And he's like, you know, I, I just had to go back and I, I had to tell you that, you know, you, you changed our lives. And I'm like, hey, uh -huh. you know, it's, it's OK. We're. No, we're, 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 we're all good here, man. Don't, don't cry. It's okay. And he's like, no, you don't understand. My son is nonverbal. He can't communicate with me, but I know that he wants to play video games because every Saturday morning I'll put him in my lap and we'll be watching Saturday morning cartoons and video game commercials will come on and he'll start squealing and bubbling and I know he wants to play it and I never thought it was possible. And you guys gave him that dream. And I was just like, wow, like, uh, I don't, I don't even know what to say, sir. We're, we're happy to help. And he hugged me, and we said goodbye. And, you know, that was that was the moment that I knew that what we do isn't just about video games. It's about helping people with their lives. Well, I, 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 got, I got a splinter in my eye. Just. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's hard even talking about it. it it's... It's just, it's great being able to help people like that. It's, it's, it's just a beautiful work you guys do. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll, the, I'll go to, to some questions that people did so I can <laughs> get myself together. Um, okay, one of the questions is, and probably the answer varies, but, but how long does it take an average for you guys if, if you see a new problem from, from, let's say, from drawing boards to the final design of, of a controller? So that comes, I guess, comes in two different answers. If money is no object and, you know, Bill Gates comes down from heaven and gives us a trillion dollars, um, it would take us probably 10 to 12 days because we need time to find the solution, talk it out, decide what's best, and then deploy the option. Um, especially if they can come to us, then we can get them with an appointment in Washington, D.C. within two to three weeks and then get them out the door with what they need. Unfortunately, like I said, we are very in demand right now. There's about 150 people mm -hmm. waiting in queue for funding to become available. Um, we we basically ration out the money that we're given from mm -hmm. the community so that we don't run out of money in the middle of the year. And, um, you know, we, we give it out as fast as our board allows, um, mm -hmm. which is about four to five uh, grants per week. And um, it only takes about two weeks to go through the process. But... Okay. You know, the the honest answer to the question, just like I was saying earlier, is if it's an off-the-shelf solution, like sometimes people who tell me and say, hey, Steve, I don't have any arm movement, but I want to play, and I go, oh, great, you need a quad stick. Here's the website. Go get it. And they're like, thanks. So it's literally a five-minute process. Okay. Uh, and then other times they're like, hey, I need this button moved over here, and can you chop off half the controller and turn it upside down and change it to purple? And I'm like, okay, that's going to take a little bit longer. But sure, we can do that. Okay, uh, and that question was from Eduardo, just so when he's watching, he knows I read his question. Uh, awesome. Another question that, that's from Paul Manges, a, a good friend of mine, and he said, which, is, which of the disabilities is, is the hardest one you guys face to, to adapt a new controller? Somebody who has a motor function disorder that wants to play on a Switch or any of the Nintendo Station oh, uh, platforms okay. are the hardest. Um, the, not the, only con are, the controller demands to be moved around, right? Correct, yeah. Okay. Not only is it motion-based, but Nintendo is also not very friendly to us or any organization that does what we do. So 
they are starting to implement accessibility options, but compared to PlayStation and Nintendo, who work with us, and Microsoft on PC, and Steam, who all work with us, mm -hmm. Nintendo does not. They do not currently answer our calls. So... Um, there is nothing that we can do to adapt the switch. We have no way to hack into it, and every attempt we make is blocked. So, uh, some you know, there are people who literally are saying, "We will donate money to you. Just make a controller for the switch." And we're literally saying, "We would love to," but Nintendo doesn't want us to. So, hmm. it sucks, okay. but that's the hardest. But on, on Microsoft and PlayStation and Steam, they, they actually send out uh, specs, codes, and stuff like that, so you guys can, can move around the, the hardware easier? Yeah. Yeah, man. Um, Xbox and PlayStation both have talked with us and implemented a bunch of features, which are now available on both of them under the ease of access. Uh, yeah, Microsoft I've seen that. Is... Like, like you have uh, special colors for people that are colorblind. Yep. Uh, you have now on, I, I play only Xbox, so I don't know much about the PlayStation stuff, <laughs> but now you have the, the co-pilot option on, on yes. Xbox where two controllers can be played at the same time. Yep. Yeah, we were, <laughs> we were blessed to be able to help Xbox figure out that the co-pilot was a needed thing. And that just came out of us talking with Microsoft and saying, Hey, um, you know, for a lot of these things, we wish that we could give a controller to one person and give a button or a switch to somebody else. So imagine a scenario just like the one I just told you where the dad is actually playing the game but the son is pushing the gas pedal. So the son is going to feel like he's playing the game and he is. And he's helping. And that's all that matters is they're having time together. They're playing the game together. Is he doing the most complicated thing? Is it simple to us gamers? Yes. But to him, it's playing in a world that he couldn't touch. And, so, and it's, it's a amazing. huge challenge for him, right? So, so Absolutely. you have this sense of fulfillment and achievement. You got it, buddy. Yep. And so, uh, but yeah, they, they've, they've both been really great. There's even things coming that I can't even talk about because I'm under NBA and we'll get sued. So, But there are some really great things that Xbox and PlayStation are doing. And, you know, um, Steam actually added recently um, closed captioning on each game you can see on the store whether or not it's closed captioned whether or not it's got ambient noise so if you're a deaf gamer or a blind gamer you'll know right off the bat whether or not you're going to be at a disadvantage cool well yep. th th there's just so many things that that we as uh people that that don't have any disabilities we never think about and you know disability is the easiest club in the world to join and the hardest one to leave you know, <laughs> so statistics say that by the time Everyone watching this program is 40 years old. You will know somebody who has at least had a temporary disability. And by the time you reach 65, chances are you yourself have a disability. And that's that's just cold statistics from the World Health Organization. Um, wow. Disability touches us all eventually. So it's something that I think we would all be wise to think about now and appreciate your health while you have it. And even if you don't have the perfect health, always remember that things could be worse and appreciate what life has given you. Yeah. Okay. I got all deep and philosophical there on you. Oh, yeah, you are. <laughs> I mean, I mean th this, this is by far the, the deepest interview I ever made. I mean, <laughs> usually we just oh. chat around, we, we throw out easygoing stuff, but it's one of the most <laughs> fulfilling, too. So it's, it's, I'm really enjoying it. Uh, I got a question for myself. Uh, from, from the games you guys adapt, is there a specific kind of game that is, is harder to... Okay, we talked about the, the Wii U and, and the movements, but I don't know, say racing games, uh, fighting games, shooters, or anything like that? Is... F FPS games are the hardest because they are the most demanding. So mm -hmm. uh, anything... Anything in the FPS category, I don't care whether it is the new game Dreadnought that just came out where you pilot a massive ship in the universe or you're talking Call of Duty or Halo, you need lots and lots of buttons in order to do every single action. Now that said, you'd be surprised how many of those buttons are not needed when you really think about it. So I can, I can get a game going in a Call of Duty by programming one button to look forward, a mouse or joypad to control the camera, which gives you aiming and looking around the screen, okay. one button for firing, and then another couple of optional buttons for things like launching your specials or 
throwing your grenade, things like that. But basically, with three buttons and a mouse or a joystick, I can get you playing Call of Duty. It sounds strange because you're used to using your full hands, and you should if you want to be optimal. But you can do it another way. Like, um, as I was saying, I, I myself am almost quadriplegic, so I only play with just the mouse and nothing else, and I'm able to do just fine in the, some of the like Black Ops Two is one of my favorite shooters. Um, because it doesn't involve you flying in the air, which adds a complication. Okay. But um, the, you can you can do successfully well. And I know a lot of people who are way, way, way better than I am at shooting people in the face, and they have a lot less abilities than I do. <laughs> yeah. uh, is, do you know if there are any... Because uh, now eSports is a very big thing. People are playing more yep. online, more competitive, and all of that. Yep. And, and is there any specific uh, championships or leagues or anything that you know about where, where they face off disabled gamers against each other? Because it will be fairest, I would say. It's fair and it's not. And that's uh, you're actually stepping onto a very complicated topic. So Which there is, are... Okay, prejudice. So, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it, it's, it's, not, it's not a sensitive topic. It's just a complicated one. So... Uh, people like Broly Legs, who is the only gamer who Able Gamer sponsors, uh, who go out and they play regular street. He plays regular Street Fighter tournaments and does relatively well, really, uh, considering all he uses is uh, his fingers and part of his face. Um, and he's able to whoop a lot of butts in Street Fighter. Um, you know, you have other people out there who also are in that same, um, like Nomad, who goes out and plays with his face. Um, these are. These are gamers who can play in regular tournaments, and they play fairly well. And they're usually in winning tournaments, um, not necessarily MLG top tier tournaments, but they win tournaments nonetheless. Okay. Um, and then in the big ones, they'll play at place respectively. Um, the problem is that in order for there to be a tournament for people with disabilities, you would have to be able to account for all of the various technologies that it comes with. So. For example, if you have a problem where you're pushing a button that's very hard for you, and I give you a controller that can rapid fire, that's banned in a regular tournament, but would it be allowed in a, in a tournament for people with disabilities? Okay. Well, for some people it would be a cheat. For other people it would be necessary. Um, you know, like, let's say an Overwatch tournament. If I was to plug a Zim, which is a little, little device that lets you plug a keyboard and a mouse into an Xbox, okay. is that cheating? Well, to a console player, it is. To somebody who can only use a keyboard and mouse and can't use a controller, that's necessity. So then the problem becomes, what is cheating? What is fair? What okay. is balanced? What is not? So right now, there have been no tournaments because figuring out what is a standard, quote-unquote, piece of assistive technology is a nightmare. Okay. My idea came actually from, from the Olympics because you have the, the Olympics and there are the Paralympics and that's why I did, thought maybe it was something like this. Yeah, it's uh, they have their own set of rules, but they but they also what they don't advertise is the Paralympics and the Special Olympics. They all have their own set of rules, and even they have things that are banned. So a a really good um, example is in the Special Olympics. You used to be able to. Well, first it was banned to have the steel plates that are put onto amputees' legs that allow them to run faster okay. because it makes them bounce harder and faster than natural legs can. Mm -hmm. So they were banned for a long time, and then eventually they relented and said, okay, that's fair. And then everybody had to get a pair, and they complained because it was expensive, and then it okay. became standard. And, you know, so there's a natural progression as it's mm -hmm. accepted, but again, it's complicated. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I know it's a long answer, but there you go. Okay, that, that satisfies. <laughs> <laughs> and when, when did you guys start Able Gamers? How, how old is this institution? We're about 12 years old now. We started as a tiny little blog in late 2004, early 2005. Um, we were actually an EverQuest blog, and uh, the founder uh, had it back when uh, he was playing with a friend. Um, Stephanie Walker, who had MS, and she had an attack where she was not able to play anymore, and when that happened, he got real scared and couldn't find anything on Google. There was no information on how you had a disability and played games. So, you know, luckily, the attack subsided, and Stephanie was okay, 
but it opened their eyes to the fact that there needs to be a resource online where people with disabilities can go and reach out to other people who have these same type of challenges and figure out together how do you conquer these challenges. So Able Gamers was born, and then at some point along the way, somebody issued a challenge to us to stop talking about how it needs to be done and do it. So we turned into a nonprofit, and here we are, giving out controllers and helping the world. Okay. <laughs> so so it, you guys started this on a dare, almost. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in, in a way, just, uh, you know, if, if you're going to talk about, you know, how much the world needs this thing, why don't you do the thing, and, you know, uh, we sort of had that uh, jack-of-all-trades, master-of-none problem for a while, where we were trying to do everything, like, we did video game reviews, we did blog content, we went to conferences, we, you know, were being advocates, we were talking to the government, you know, and all these wow. things, and it's all very cool, but now that we're, we've been doing it for a while, if you watch Able Gamers, you'll be able to see that we are narrowing down what we do, and that is just helping people. You know, there are there are other people out there who are now um, fighting the government, and that's great. And then there are, you know, to be honest, um, the industry has come along so so far from when we started. Like when we started this, man, we did an interview at the Game Accessibility Conference. Oh, sorry, not Game Accessibility. The uh, GDC. Okay. Uh, and in the GDC, we asked one question, and that was, have you ever thought about people with disabilities? This is back in 2006. And almost every single one of them said no. And one douchebag laughed at us and walked away. So, uh, yeah. So now you ask that same question, people say, yeah, of course we have. And they start naming off the things that they've thought of or that they've read the guides that we put out or that our competitors have put out and, you know, it, it's 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 become an industry thing now where people are trying to be inclusive. So we don't have to we don't have to champion that horse quite as much as we used to because now people get it. They understand why people with disabilities need help. So makes your job much easier, right? Yeah, it lets us focus on helping people instead of having to beat people over the head with the fact that they should want to help. Or, or laugh at your face, right? Yo, oh, I wish I could find that guy. Man, do I wish I could find that guy. Uh, I'm, I'm almost sure he's not in the industry anymore. It's, <laughs> it's, it's changed so much in the last few years. And, and stuff yeah. like that usually catch up with you. So. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I, I hope Karma bit him in the ass for that one. Yeah. Do you guys did anything with VR already? Like <laughs> Oculus, PlayStation VR? So we actually are working with a lot of VR companies, including Google VR and PlayStation and a couple of other small ones in Montreal, Canada. Okay. The problem, again, motion controls. In order to play yeah. VR, you need two fully functional standard eyes. You need the ability to move. You need the ability to not sit in a chair. Um, there are exceptions to this rule. Um, for example... You know, if you're somebody who is in a burn unit after a war trauma or a house fire or an accident, I can put a virtual goggle on your head and I can put you into the uh, Jurassic Park theme park, which is just a virtual ride where you basically sit there and watch the dinosaurs go by. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can have an enjoyable experience and forget about your troubles for a little while. But in other simulators, uh, you have to be able to move around, turn your head. You have to be able to move and move your arms. And if you can't do that, all I can do is put it on your head, put you in front of a beach, and then you can just look at the water, which is going to get boring after five minutes. So, okay. you know, uh, so it's a mixed bag. Uh, one, one of my favorite quotes for interviews is always to say that accessibility is harder the more accessible a game gets. So okay. like when you... When, when people say accessible, they usually mean mobile games like Switches mm -hmm. and tablets and phones and virtual reality. Mm -hmm. But that's not accessible to my crowd. That's actually the opposite. So, you know, we come up with this new technology. I mean, think, think about this, right? So PlayStation 4 came out not too long ago, about five years almost now. And mm -hmm. when it came out, we had all this technology for the PlayStation 3, and it was all junk because it didn't work with PlayStation 4. So, oh, holy shit. So, so now we've got, you know, all this PlayStation 4 stuff. And then just last week, they started talking about PlayStation 5. And I'm like, oh, great, here we go again. So, you know, every time we get a handle on it, they push the bar a little bit further. So it's right. constantly a game of catch-up. At, at least you got more support from them, right? Right. Than, than yeah, this, years ago. this time I expect it to be easier. Okay, great. 
no, I'm going to ask you, you some questions. Uh, you mentioned Call of Duty Black Ops 2. Yeah. Uh, is that your favorite game, or do you have something else you like? No, my, my current game is Overwatch. That's what I play right now. Oh, um, every, everybody's playing that. Everybody plays Overwatch. Yeah, it's it's a phenomenal game. I've gotten to argue with the creator about whether or not to use Zim, which is great. That the controller I mentioned earlier. So yeah, I I have a I have a love hate relationship with Blizzard because they don't always like me when I'm mouthy about uh, how we should, assistive technology should be allowed. But uh, they haven't banned it yet, so that's great. Um, but yeah, I love the game. Uh, I'm not always the best at it, but I like it. So uh, cool. that's one of my favorites. And uh, yeah. uh, and you're apparently into shooters, right? <laughs> I, I am. I am into. Uh, I mean, I'm a competitive guy. So um, when I uh, when I first uh, started gaming, I was into like MMOs like Diablo and Ultima Online and stuff like that. And then I got into a game called Star Seas Tribes. Tribes was, is um, it, it's not it's, it's not a it's not a shooter that did really 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 well. Um, they Tribes is still out there. I think the last one was Tribes Ascension or something like that. Um, okay. It's made by the same the same guys that make Smite. Okay, um, Smite rings a bell. Yeah, so it's made by them. It, it it got eclipsed by like Halo and all that. But at any rate, I used to be a pretty good player back in Tribes, and it was sort of like Halo and Call of Duty had a baby. And uh, I was in like the lower leagues of MLG, and uh, I started losing the ability to use a mouse and a keyboard at the same time. And that's when I actually found Able Gamers was when I was trying to figure out what what did my life look like as my disability got worse. So uh, I I am a, I am a competitive guy at heart, and I I wish my arms still had the ability because I would love to be uh, a Call of Duty player. But uh, I don't have I don't have the reflexes partially because I'm disabled, partially because I'm not 14 anymore. And that that's, if, if you're not, if you're not a teenager. You're not gonna do great in Call of Duty. I I agree with that. I mean I'm I, I'm almost 38 now. I have a small kid, and I, I'm a big Gears of War fan. Ah yes. But I go online and I get my ass whipped by, <laughs> by and they open up the audio at the end of the round and you see like people like this 12, 11 year old kids like saying, Oh, you lost! And I'm like, Yeah. I <laughs> yeah, you just got whooped by a 12 year old. Yep. Yeah, and, much. and I'm like level 45, and I'm pretty proud of it. And they're like 280. And I'm like, yeah, and then, yeah, yeah, okay. they're laughing at you because you're bad. You're like, damn it, let's I'm trying, kid, leave me alone. Yeah, <laughs> don't pick on me. You're bullying <laughs> me, right? I will, I will get my 10 year old. You just wait. <laughs> yeah, I gotta train my small kid, but he's only one year old, so he's still got some time. Yeah, like two years, man. He better go pro. Oh yeah. <laughs> he actually every morning I I uh, he grabs uh, when he 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 wakes up I usually bring him to bed and he just yep. jumps to my controllers and Aww. and he figure out when he was like 6 months old that he could press the button and it will start blinking when it turns on that the Xbox controller and the TV will turn on automatically. Oh, yeah. And then he just starts moving things around, and he just likes that the TV starts flashing. But one day he almost reset my console, and I'm like, oh, no, you, you should stop playing now. <laughs> He's going to start putting passwords on your computer. You're like, damn it. He, he just went into the store, and he was almost <laughs> buying stuff, and I didn't have any codes in that, so I said, oh, now I should stop. <laughs> yeah, yeah, time to put the daddy locks on that real quick. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but But he's amazing. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, besides gaming, what stuff are you into? Uh, comics, uh, movies, superheroes? Because I mean, they uh, usually walk together, right? They do. They usually go hand in hand. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a big superhero guy. Iron Man is the best. Any of you Team Captain people can go suck it. Um, <laughs> okay, but, uh, I'm, I'm leaving. <laughs> all right, bye. Get out. My interview now. My show. Um, I, I uh, like yeah. Iron Man better than, than Captain America, but on Civil War, I was Team Captain because I agree oh, with Steve yeah. Rogers. All right. Well, well, this is now my show. I'm not taking it over. Uh, <laughs> thank you for joining the Steve Spawn Show. Uh, <laughs> I've impeached your leader. Sorry. Um, no, I, I, I'm, I'm big into the superhero stuff, but also... In my spare time, I'm a writer, so I do a lot of stuff with uh, reading and learning how to do, get better at my craft. Um, on the on the nerdier side of stuff, I'm I'm usually into action movies and that kind of stuff. I actually just started watching The Badlands, which is amazing. 
thumbs up to Daniel Wu. Into the Badlands, that, that series? Yeah, yeah. I watch it. Pretty cool. I'm only on episode three, so don't spoil it, but it seems pretty amazing. I won't. <laughs> okay, and you said you write. I do, yeah. F fiction, books, comics? Yeah, I, uh, so I'm a fiction writer. Um, my, uh, so my, my debut novel was a novel about a uh, sort of a 24-plus uh, MacGyver guy who just manages to find things and get into trouble. And uh, from there, I'm sort of branching out. And, and I haven't written any new books in a while just because I've been so busy with Able Gamer stuff. But, you know, my goal is to eventually get some people on board with Able Gamer so I don't have to do it all. And then I can get back to my writing career at the same time. Okay. What's the name of the book and where can we find it? Oh, it's a horrible book. Don't go buy it. It's it's called it's called The Finder. You can you can get it off of Amazon. Um, man, it was written five years ago, and I've already learned how to write so much better than that. I'm probably probably one of the only writers in America who's like, yeah, I can do better. Don't judge me by that. But uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, it was a great experience. Actually, I really I kind of enjoyed it. You know, the weird thing about it is, it gave me a really um, a really cool insight into what developers go through when they have to figure out these stories and these backgrounds. And, you know, we, we like, Oh, well, Gears of War is great. Well, actually somebody sat down and spent a lot of time figuring out how the locust would work and, you know, how the whole universe goes. And it was really kind of uh, an eye opening experience to, you know, these things don't just magically come together. A lot of people pour a lot of their souls into it. So, mm -hmm. and, and the whole thing has to make sense, right? Right. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, yeah, it's fun to just shoot orcs in the face, but yeah, there has to be a reason why you're doing it. Yeah, especially when you have the, these long franchises like, I don't know, the Gears of War, you have Mass Effect, yeah. you have Halo, and yeah. it expands over four, five, six games and the whole universe, and then you have the spin-offs, and everything has to make sense. <laughs> yeah, everything has to be connected, and everything yeah. has to work, and yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's amazing. You can see why there are teams of writers that do this. Yeah. Because so far they, they don't they can't do what DC and Marvel does that is parallel universes and different timelines and stuff like that. <laughs> Gamers it's, don't accept this yet. <laughs> no, no, they do not. I, yeah, I was, I was for a second there I thought you meant steal off of each other, but yeah, that too. Oh no, I mean I mean like like X Men movies. I mean. I, I, oh yeah, I get what you're saying. Yeah. I, I have a friend that every week he comes and he says. Oh, I watched the Logan movie. It doesn't make sense because in X Men Two <laughs> or X Men Three, the ex Professor Xavier died, and I'm said, "Well, yeah. it's a different timeline." And he's like, "That doesn't make sense." And I said, "Yeah, it does." And yeah, yeah, it's actually his his brother's body who was in a coma, who they hadn't mentioned until episode seventy two, and uh, he transported his consciousness at the last second when right before Phoenix took it. Yeah, like yeah. It's Thank you. <laughs> That's a very simple explanation, and he doesn't get that. <laughs> yes, it's 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 weird to to those of us who like that kind of stuff. It's like, oh, this is this is easy. What are you talking about? And then somebody looks at you like you're from outer space, and you're like, what? It makes sense. <laughs> to draw you a diagram? Yeah, I hear what you mean, though. No, they don't really do that in video games yet. Uh, I, which is weird because you would think with video game technology they would like it. You know. We have resets, we have respawns. I often think of that movie with uh, Tom Cruise, The Edge of Tomorrow. Like, that reminded me so much of a video game. Like, oh, it didn't work, reset, try again. <laughs> yeah, that, that that movie, for me, it's like it's like Saving Private Ryan and Exosuits meets Groundhog Day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much exactly it. <laughs> but it's what they do. Yeah. Well, Stephen, uh, I got a final question, and this yeah. is uh, how can people help out Able Gamers for you guys doing your work, uh, spreading the world, and, and how, how can we, people contribute to this amazing work you guys do? So anybody who's listening or watching you guys can go to uh, ablegamers.org. We have... Um, a fantastic setup of you know, examples of people that we've helped and information on how you can get help and uh, references for common everyday problems that can be solved relatively easily. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we're constantly working on our funding. Um, if you go to ablegamers.donordrive.com, there's also a link directly through ablegamers.org. But um, 
And we're we're constantly finding people to go out and do streaming and you know raise a little bit of money and um, you know you you had mentioned Game Ranks and you know we're we're working with them to do uh, a team later this year so maybe you can join up with them and you know get your friends to raise some money you know that's that's the kind of things that we're doing is you know the, our organization is built on gamers helping gamers um, you know so far no government in the world. Um, is into providing money for people to play games. They don't quite get it the same way we do yet. So they're coming around, but it's not there yet. So until then, we've got to take care of our own. We've got to be be willing to help people who need help. Okay. And you mentioned you guys help people in Brazil. What if somebody here in Brazil that, that knew some electronics and how to do welding and stuff like that wanted to set up their, I don't know, let's say their a daughter help helping part in Brazil. Should they contact you directly or? Yeah, I mean anybody who wants to offer their services, um, as you know, uh, it's not just about funding. You can go to our website, send an email to inquiries at ablegamers.org. Reach out to us, let us know what your skills are, and you know if, if we can ever utilize your talents in your area, then we'll we'll definitely do that. And you know. Once in a while, uh, we find somebody who is a great fit for our team, and then they just sort of like our people in the UK. You know, they just reach out, say, "Hey, how can I help?" And then they turn out fitting in great. And then now, if someone needs help near their you know area in Manchester, England, or whatnot, then we have somebody in that area that we can send. So you know, if you you find it in your heart that you like to help people with disabilities, you can always reach out to us. And then when somebody comes our way who needs help, we'll put you in touch. That's amazing. Yeah, I mean, it, like I said, man, it, it's not a marketing line. It really is gamers helping gamers. And, you know, any way that we can help each other, we all understand how important gaming is. Nobody watching this and you and I, we all understand. I don't need to give you the speech of why gaming is important. You know why it is. No, so. I mean, if, if you're watched so far in this interview, you, you know what games is all about. <laughs> exactly. And, so, and you know. I want to tell people gaming is all about fun. I mean, there's yeah. there's esports, there's competitive it is a huge business, but for us, it's it's just about having fun, hanging out with people uh, online or, or at your own house, and just enjoying it. You know, well, you know, my my thought on that is always, why has fun become such a dirty word? Why are people so afraid to just say, I want to go have fun? You know, it's like when you go hang out with your friends, you're just trying to go have fun. When you're playing a game, you're trying to have fun. So... Why is it such a dirty concept that people with disabilities might need a little bit of help going to have fun, you know? And, and that's sort of what our organization is built off of, you know? It's, there's no shame in wanting to have some enjoyment in your life. Exactly. All, all work and no fun makes Joe a dull guy, right? Exactly. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> okay. Steven, uh, once again, thank you very much for your time, for your help. It was uh, yeah. very emotional, very uh, inspiring, and very instructive. Yeah, sorry for your allergies. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> yeah, but uh, uh, I hope that um, your, your viewers will um, connect with the cause, and we can always use more people who, at the very least, are out there reminding their friends and family that, People with disabilities might need a little bit of help, but you know, ultimately, it's just about, like you said, having fun. Great. Well, thanks a lot for having me, my friend. I appreciate it. It, it was it was my pleasure, and I'll be keep my eyes open for the events you mentioned about you guys, and and, and to spread the word about this. Congratulations awesome. once again, and and please send my best to everybody involved at Able Gamers. You guys are amazing. We will do. Thanks a lot. I appreciate your time. Bye bye. Bye. Bom, obrigado por, por ter visto o vídeo chegado nesse ponto. Espero que tenham gostado. Vocês viram que foi bem emocionante aí, até caiu o cisco no meu olho aí uns momentos do vídeo. E como eu disse no começo, a gente está organizando uma maratona de jogos aí para conscientizar, principalmente conscientizar as pessoas sobre essas possibilidades. Eu acho que tem muita gente que não consegue jogar. Que, que não tem acesso ou que, que se priva de, de jogar de videogame por não conhecer, então o, o ponto principal do nosso evento aí é fazer essa divulgação, é, obviamente a gente vai tentar arrecadar fundos, eu acho que é uma maneira legal de incentivar esse pessoal, de ajudá-los, esses controles, vocês entrarem no, no site do pessoal da Able Gamers, eu vou deixar o link aqui embaixo, é, não são baratos, esses controles especiais eles custam 300, 400, 500 dólares aí para fazer a adaptação, 
Então, é uma forma da gente tentar ajudar o pessoal aí. Vamos conversar com eles para que eles tentem direcionar esses fundos aqui para o Brasil. Então, como eu falei, 19 de agosto vai rolar uma maratona de jogos a partir do meio-dia. É, vamos divulgar. Aqui embaixo já tem o link do, do, do fundraiser, né, da, da campanha de arrecadação de fundos para a gente fazer isso. É, se você tiver um canal no YouTube, se você tiver, fizer streaming no Bean, no Twitch, é, em qualquer plataforma, se você quiser ajudar a gente a participar, entre em contato, manda um e-mail ou entra nesse link aqui abaixo e se inscreve. É, vamos tentar aumentar aí o número de, de pessoas. Eu já, já falei com várias pessoas, tem várias pessoas que, é, interessadas em ajudar, que, que vão trazer, acho que a ideia é espalhar essa conversa para o máximo de pessoas possíveis. Então, é, divulga esse vídeo, principalmente, é, divulga para as pessoas que você conhece, para a gente poder montar uma coisa bem legal e, e, e espalhar essa palavra. Aí vamos aproveitar que é agosto, aí, mês de Criança Esperança, Mac Lunch Feliz, está todo mundo muito caridoso, querendo ajudar. Vamos fazer isso também para a comunidade que a gente apoia, que é a comunidade de videogames. Falou, galera. Obrigado, um abração e até a próxima.